morning. morning. Welcome to Divinity Lutheran Church. We're here to worship the one true triune God and to be spiritually fed through his means of grace. I'm sorry it's chilly in here this morning. I'm not quite sure why. I had already changed the time on the thermostat, so I don't know. It's not that the furnace isn't working. The temperature has come up a bit since I got here. 63 degrees is not what we wanted it to be, so I'm sorry it's so chilly. Uh, this is Saints Triumphant Sunday. The theme for the service is We Live as Confident Saints. God will bless us as we worship today. Let's begin by singing Jerusalem the Gold. children, though we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. 
but trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
The gospel lesson is taken from the gospel of St. Mark, chapter 13, beginning with the 24th verse. But after that distress in those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then you will see the Son of Man coming on clouds with great power and glory. At that time you will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the sky. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Be seated for the hymn of the day, Behold the Host, arrayed in white.
grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I got a phone call from a friend this week. Uh, it's a friend that uh, graduated from seminary with me, served as a pastor for a number of years. Eventually had to leave the ministry because of um, some health problems uh, that his wife was experiencing. He needed to be able to give, give more of his time to taking care of his wife, but he still will help uh, preach at uh, churches where he lives, help with other things, teach Bible classes every once in a while. He was just looking for my advice on a situation that came his way, wherein his pastor, the church where his family belongs, uh, came down with COVID, and uh, his wife and one child also with COVID. In fact, of the 50 people that were in attendance the previous Sunday, seven of them got COVID, so 14% of the people there. And this pastor reached out to my friend um, late Friday night. Can you preach for me on Sunday? He was really struggling with what to do. He hadn't been a regular preacher for a while, so just a day or two warning was a little stressful for him. But he also didn't know what the right thing to do was. He and his family had, had uh, not been attending worship, watching online because of his wife's health problems. They really were afraid of exposing her. So it would be the right thing for him to go and help out those saints, but possibly uh, put his wife at risk. He wasn't even sure if it was the right thing for the church to be gathering. 14% of the congregation becoming infected in one day Maybe the right thing was to, to shut down for a couple of weeks. But he also felt that that desire to help out his pastor. And he admitted he was, of course, struggling with his own pride. Someday he wants to get back into the ministry. He wants to be able to show people that he can do it. I don't know if what I said was any help to my friend at all. Because what he was struggling with is what we all struggle with. Making decisions when we don't have enough information, when there's information that's hidden from us. For example, it would have been a lot easier for him to make his decision if he knew. So how many people coming on this Sunday are infected but don't know it? Or how strong is my wife's immune system? It reminded me of what we've been dealing with for a year and a half. We've had to make so many decisions without enough information, and we just recently struggled with, with a big one, and maybe you saw the announcement in the bulletin. Uh, the church council has decided we're gonna uh, make a, somewhat of a return to normalcy starting Sunday, December 5th. We will no longer require uh, people to sit in every other pew. Fortunately, we've been blessed lately with good enough attendance that that's kind of been impossible in some Sundays. And we're also going to return to uh, our traditional way of distributing communion. But this was in no way an easy decision. It's a conversation we've had almost monthly for a year and a half. Time and time again, we'd say, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. And eventually, we can't just keep kicking that can down the road. But boy, is there other information we wish we needed. All sorts of our decisions in life are like that, right? We have to make a decision with less than adequate information. There's things that are hidden from you that you wish you knew. There's nothing better than learning information that you really want, that you thought was hidden, and then it's revealed. That's one of the best, that's going to be one of the best things about when Jesus returns. The hidden will be revealed. The hidden will be revealed. What's hidden? We call today Saints Triumphant Sunday. You are not Saints Triumphant. I am not a Saint Triumphant. We are Saints Militant, or the Church Militant. Meaning, we still struggle. The church struggles. 
And because the church struggles now, sometimes it's as if the glory of Jesus is hidden. Now we know that Jesus is no longer in his state of humiliation when he, when he didn't make full use of the power and glory that are rightfully his as true God. He's now in his state of exaltation. But to human eyes, to our eyes and the eyes of others, it sometimes seems as if Jesus' glory is hidden because we, the church, struggle. We struggle with a lot of things, don't we? We struggle with the world. More and more, our culture seems to be becoming, seems to be, uh, becoming less and less Christian. There's more hostility for Christianity. There's something weekly that reminds me of this, if not daily. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was the week after Halloween, somewhere on the internet, I saw all these people raving about this amazing Halloween costume where a, where a grown man dressed as Jesus to go to a Halloween. And it looked so realistic. And he was on a like a, a hoverboard or something and made it look like clouds. But he was like coming on the clouds like in our lesson. To me, that's incredibly offensive. That's Jesus. He's not a Halloween costume. He's not something to get a laugh from people. But boy, did the internet eat it up. Now, of course, the internet didn't exist 50 years ago. But would that have been a popular thing 50 years ago? No. There's one example of how much we are struggling more and more with our culture, with, with the world around us. We struggle with stupid pandemic. It, it's, I, yeah, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've heard me say it before, but it's almost as if this, this disease was created by Satan to hurt the church. What's the worst thing to do? Sit together in an enclosed space and sing. And it has hurt the church. It's absolutely true. The church has been hurt. Many, many, many churches have had attendance decline drastically and recover some, but not come back anywhere to what it used to be before the pandemic. I've heard many stories of churches torn apart by all the different opinions. Do we wear masks? Do we not? Vaccines? No. Politics drag into it including Wells churches, where people have left the church. You didn't start meeting together soon enough. You started meeting together too soon, people on both sides of the issue. Unfortunately, blessedly, according to God's grace, our church, I don't feel like, has been torn apart. We have different opinions, and I've heard different people express different opinions, sometimes even forcefully. But to my knowledge, no one has left the church. No one has said, I don't want to be a member here anymore. So that's a great lesson. But still, boy, have we struggled with this pandemic. We struggle, all of us, every day, with our sinful natures. Not doing what we should. Doing what we shouldn't. And actually, why don't I let the expert describe this. St. Paul, in Romans chapter 7, the, the, classic, the classic scripture for struggling with the sinful nature. And I think it's always helpful for us to remember, this is Paul, you know? The missionary, St. Paul, this is how he describes it. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not keep doing what I want, and said I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who am doing it, but it is sin living in me. Indeed, I know that the good does not live in me, that is, in my sinful flesh. The desire to do good is present with me, but I am not able to carry it out. So I fail to do the good I want to do. Instead, the evil I do not want to do, that is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who am doing it but it is sin living in me. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil 
this presently. I certainly delight in God's law, according to my inner self, but I see a different law at work in my members, waging war against the law of my mind, and taking me captive to the law of sin, which is present in my members. What a miserable wretch I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, because that's who will rescue me and rescue us from that body of death. But that is a pretty eloquent description of our struggle with our sinful nature. Perhaps it's your pet sin, or sin of weakness, that, that sin that you know it's a sin, and you don't want to do it. Sometimes you just find yourself doing it without even realizing it. You didn't make a conscious decision. You didn't say, I'm going to choose evil over good. It just happens. Or perhaps it is. Those moments of weakness when you do choose, you know it's a sin, you struggle with it, but you give in. We want to do good. We know God's love for us. We love him. We want to serve him with a life that honors him and serves others, and yet we fail again and again. Not all the time, but a lot more than we would like. Where's the glory of Jesus? When we struggle so badly. We, his people, struggle so badly with sin. And of course, we struggle with death. For some people, more, more, than, more than typical over the last year and a half. Last week I talked about, you know, I have a lot of experience in, you know, with, with the dying, and I know a number of you have as well, including the people very close to you, people you love very much. And there's a truth about death that I don't think we should hide. Death itself is terrible. Death itself is bad. It's ugly. It's not, it's not part of the circle of life. It's not a natural thing. It's an unholy corruption of nature. It's the opposite of life. Some people have deaths that aren't as awful as others. But death is never good. It's always ugly always bad. And it's coming for all of us. That one constant, and all that, as I say, taxes. We struggle with death, the death of others, our own impending death. That's what's going to make Judgment Day so great. Yes, for now it seems as if the glory of Jesus is hidden as we the saints, we the church, struggle but the hidden will be revealed. The glory of Jesus, the glory of Jesus will be obvious. The last couple of years, I've been on a real kick uh, reading mystery novels, um, TV show. I, I love, there's some good British TV series, British mysteries are better than American. TV, movie, books, good mysteries have a few things in common. Now, most of these are murder mysteries. What keeps the narrative going, what drives everything forward, what keeps you interested in a, as a reader, mostly is finding out who did it. And when you find out who did it in the end, if it's a good mystery, it's always a surprise Yet also, as you think back, it's obvious. It's always someone who's been present all along. It's not a brand new character who comes out of nowhere. It's someone who's been there the whole time. You're surprised when it's revealed, and yet when you think back, well, duh, there's this, there's that, there's that, there's that, I should have realized this, I should have realized that. In hindsight, it's obvious. Well, on the last day, the glory of Jesus will be obvious. Then you will see the Son of Man coming on clouds with great power and glory. Will that not be the greatest sight of your life? Aren't there so many times in life where you wished the people who hate Jesus the people who hate the church or your loved one that you want to know Jesus, just wish you could see, there's Jesus on the clouds with all this power and glory. Well, we will see it. All of us. We're all going to see it. Jesus 
with the power and glory that is his, the way he should be seen. At least that's how we The way we want him to be seen. He won't be hidden anymore. Every single person will see him. Well, what do we do now? Well, just like in a mystery novel, once you know the secret, you look back, it's obvious. Right now, we should make an effort to try to see the glory of Jesus. Yes, in a certain way, it's hidden from our eyes and the eyes of others. But if you look, you can certainly find evidence of the glory of Jesus. I maybe have in some ways, more opportunity to see that than you because of the awesome work that I get to do. I get to see the catechism students when the light goes on. I get to see them learning. I, I get to, to witness when they, when they start answering those questions designed to make sure they understand that we're saved by grace alone. When they start, under, when they start answering those questions correctly every time. Consistent. There's the glory of Jesus. Jesus working through his word to, to change hearts and minds. I get to, I get to sit with the dying and the sick and hear beautiful confessions of faith. Last week I, I talked about how sometimes some people express uncertainty that, that bothers me and I try to do what I can to to address that, but many, many times I get to hear just wonderful, beautiful confessions of faith from people who are in, in, in the middle of, of suffering, and yet they confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they need it. I get to sit with those who are struggling with sin, struggling with doubts, when I get to apply God's word, I get to absolve them of their sins, tell them that they have full and free forgiveness, and see the change in their face. To see the evidence of Jesus working through his gospel, the glory and power of Jesus. What about you? Can you think of examples where you do see the glory of Jesus in your life? I'll give you one. If you're here, there's so much working against you. There's so much. Sleeping in is one of the greatest pleasures in life, isn't it? Sleep in, especially on a cold Sunday morning, the first snow, the first stupid ice of the year. I'm sure more than one of you struggled with that temptation this morning. And yet you're here. You're here at a church that's a little bit colder. Oh, it's up to 64 now. Ooh, ooh. It's a little bit colder than we would like. Where's the glory of Jesus in that? Well, he is the one who brought you here. He is the one who strengthens your faith. He is the one who causes you to love him. In a culture that thinks it's stupid for you to be, you are. Parents, you get to see your, your children come home from Christian day school or Sunday school and sing that song, I am Jesus of the Lamb, or whatever it is. Say their memory work. I would love to hear later, some of you have this, some examples you want to share with me. What are the examples in your life where you can see the glory of Jesus? Sometimes it seems like it's hidden, but you see it. You see him working in your life. You see him working in the lives of others. Saw it yesterday, or adopt a family shopping event, to see people come together excited to go and, and buy gifts for the new people they've never met and probably never will. But that's not the reflection of Jesus' glory and love, I don't know what is. And here's the amazing thing, if you've never done this, this was our experience yesterday. We went out, and we almost had a hard time finding enough presents with the amount of money that you people gave for this project. It's so generous. The love that you show for people you've never met and probably never will. Yes, some of Jesus' glory, in a certain sense, is hidden from our eyes right now. But you can see it 
in certain areas of your life. And it will be revealed to you. The glory of Jesus will be obvious. What other hidden things will be revealed on that day? I want to share with you what pastors were. Probably the number one thing. A person I haven't seen in a long time. The person who used to come to church and then they stopped. Or, or the person who's a member of this church but from the day I got here has never been here. Or very rarely. Does that person have faith? Or, or and maybe they do, but it must be weak. And is it so weak that wrong thing happens in their life, it could crush that faith? And what do I do as a pastor? The worst thing is just to ignore it and pretend like it doesn't exist. Do I call? Do I write a letter? Do I try to schedule a visit with them? Do I just show up unannounced? Is one way likely to offend them so that they won't listen to what I have to say? How can I show them love the best while also reminding them that staying away from the means of grace is a sin? These are not easy things. Thank God. I really do thank God for the doctrine of election. That's what Jesus refers to. You will see the Son of Man coming on clouds with great power and glory. At that time, he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the sky. The hidden will be revealed. The elect, in his grace, in Jesus' grace, will be obvious. Right now, they aren't. I don't know who the elect are. Jesus does. Let me give you a little bit more on that, that doctrine of election, in case it's been a little while since you've reviewed it. One good place to go is Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He did this when he chose us in Christ. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and, of course, daughters through Jesus Christ. He did this in accordance with the good purpose of his will. The doctrine of election is also referred to in the Old Testament lesson in Daniel. At that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. The doctrine of election says, before you even existed, you were chosen. Chosen by Jesus to be saved. Now, logic would say, if, if, if Jesus chose some to be saved, well, then everybody else he must have chosen to, to be condemned to hell. But that is not what Scripture says. Scripture never says that. So we don't. Scripture gives us this wonderful, comforting gospel promise. Jesus chose you. What's comforting about that? Number one, that means it doesn't depend on you in any way whatsoever. He chose you, not the other way around. In fact, he chose you before you even existed. You can't take credit for something that happened before you even existed. He chose you. He wrote your name in this book. We call it, as Scripture does, the book of life. There is a book where your name is recorded. And when Jesus returns, perhaps maybe the picture is he will show that book to these angels. And he'll say, okay, go get these folks. It's a cool detail that the angels are part of this, isn't it? Maybe not super important, but it's, it's, it's really a neat detail to think of. The angels, Jesus sends them out to gather the elect. From the, as Mark says, from the four winds, in other words, four directions, everywhere, north, south, east, west. From the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the sky, or that's, that's the Greek word that can also be translated as heaven, or heavens. So the elect from those who are still 
alive when Jesus returns, as well as those who are in heaven. All will be gathered. The elect in his grace will be obvious. We will get to see all of those who truly have faith in Jesus. Those saints who are already triumphant, who are in heaven, they'll join us and we become saints triumphant. The church triumphant. I really think it is an interesting way to think about the last day, that this is the day when the hidden will be revealed. We will see the glory and power of Jesus. And one of the ways we'll see the glory and power of Jesus is in the, the revealing of the elect. I know it feels like the church is constantly under siege, that you are a minority. And I mean, I think we are, right, in this world? Possible to know for sure, but it seems like we are. But on that day, do you know how many saints you're going to see? I don't. I don't know. But I know it's going to be a lot. I know it's going to be more than we can imagine seeing right now. Saints from every time and every place. Saints who are triumphant, who are no longer struggling with the world, with sickness, with sin, with death. Saints triumphant. Over the last year, we actually only had one member of our congregation pass away. John Elliott. It makes me happy to think of John triumphant right now. You know, the last couple of years of John's life were not easy. We were quite different. But that's all gone. He's triumphant in heaven with his Savior. We'll see him. We'll see him on that day. He will be revealed to us as well as so many others. The hidden will be revealed. It's going to be a great twist, a great resolution to this amazing story that God has created through him. I may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Please stand. Let's confess our faith as saints have done for hundreds of years with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Bring forward the offering now. throughout the ages have witnessed to your name, the mighty and the lowly, great leaders, and the humble men and women, those who have served you in prosperity, and those who in the day of trouble have not failed, those in foreign places and those in this land. You rejoice, rejoice that they now rest from their labors in your presence. Heavenly Father, we recall with thanksgiving what you have done for your church through that. May their good works prompted by your love in Christ and perform your glory while here on earth encourage us to live for you. As we join our worship and work with theirs, may we acknowledge ourselves to be part of that great cloud of witnesses from every age and place. Unite all your people in the true faith 
in the hope of an eternity at your side, and in the love that reveals us to be your children. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. Holy Spirit, our comfort in trouble and guide through life, as you have protected and prospered your saints in the past, look with favor on us now and bring us safely to eternal glory. Amen. We pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We sing, Be Still My Soul.
you stand. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Bring us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Sunday school or Bible class that day. 
And then I, I you know the big announcement um, that I referred to in the sermon. Um, next time we have communion, so next Sunday, uh, we will return to the normal practice. Uh, coming forward to the rail, both individual cup and common cup will be offered. Uh, if you are not comfortable coming up here and you would prefer that, that we bring communion to you, talk to uh, the usher or to me before the service to let us know, and we will, we will do that. We will bring communion to you. Uh, and then we're going to wait until uh, December 5th to start having every pew um, available to sit. Uh, none of this is written in stone. If circumstances change again, we need to make the change, become a little bit more restrictive. We will. We hope not. Part of the reason we've waited as long as we have is because we didn't have to change again. But if we need to, um, we will. So thank you for your understanding. Uh, our church council, I appreciate their, uh, their uh, willingness to make hard decisions over the last year and a half. Um, everyone is invited downstairs for fellowship time, Bible class, teen Bible study up here, and Sunday school. Please greet those sitting around you.